North Island. She was not the stuff that dreams are made of. This windswept island, sitting isolated at the tip of a peninsula in San Diego Bay. Yet she was destined to become one of the magnificent arenas of human endeavor. She would bear witness to men and events that would create aviation history. She would hold both the dream and the reality of one of man's most primal obsessions, the desire to fly. Two thousand acres of yucca, sagebrush, and jackrabbits, a sandy beach, a warm climate, and gentle breezes laid the foundation for future greatness. The only sounds to be heard along the lonely beach were yelps and barks of marine animals. North Island was first sighted by the Spanish explorer Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo when he sailed into San Diego Bay in 1542. The island became part of Spanish territory for almost 300 years and eventually was transferred to the ownership of Mexico by 1821. Then, in 1849, California became a part of the United States. North Island and its sister island of the South, Coronado, were sold in 1886 to Elisha Babcock and Hampton Story, partners in the Coronado Beach Company, which built the magnificent Hotel del Coronado in 1888. Guests of the hotel used the vast empty spaces of North Island for beach play, horseback riding, picnic lunches, and hunting. By the end of the 20th century, the Coronado Beach Company, the hotel, and all the land not purchased by homeowners was sold to Hawaiian sugar magnate John D. Spreckles. Spreckles transformed Coronado with his railways and his various businesses, and built a beautiful home in Coronado along Glorieta Bay. Passionate about transportation advances, Spreckles was interested in the pioneering aviation efforts taking place on the East Coast with the Wright brothers, and he saw opportunities in the potential of aviation. Flying demonstrations in France and the United States were becoming all the rage, and Spreckles spoke with San Diego and Coronado officials about staging a flying demonstration at the Coronado Polo Grounds in 1910. On January 23, 1910, the first powered flight in the country took place on the polo fields by pioneer aviator Charles Hamilton. Hamilton flew a Curtis Pusher airplane, developed by New York pioneer aviator Glenn Curtis. Glenn Curtis dreamed of the day when air travel would be commonplace, and he also saw vast potential for the use of airplanes in military operations. The United States Navy was exploring the possibility of using planes for spotting and reconnaissance. Curtis and the Navy seemed a perfect match. Curtis negotiated with Spreckles for a three-year lease of North Island, basically rent-free, to establish a training school for military and civilian aviators. The Navy sent several young men for training at the North Island School, nicknamed Camp Trouble, including Theodore Ellison, who achieved the rare honor of being designated Naval Aviator No. 1. The first aviation school was formed with six students and three airplanes. The first plane, an A-1 capable of flying a breathtaking 45 miles per hour, was sold to the Navy in 1911 for $4,400. Curtis would later become known as the father of naval aviation. Curtis experimented with planes on North Island, including planes that could land and take off from the water. He also thought planes could be hoisted on ships and possibly even take off from the ships if the right platforms were built. Soon, the Triad, Curtis's newest invention, flew the first successful amphibian flight in the world, taking off from and landing in the Spanish Bight. Camp Trouble stayed on North Island until 1912, when the training school was temporarily moved to Annapolis, Maryland. The U.S. Army also started a military base on North Island called Rockwell Field, located at the south end of North Island. The Army and Navy shared the skies as advances in aeronautical technology were made. When World War I began in 1914, the military use of planes became critically important to the war effort. The decision was made to create a permanent naval air station on North Island. Lieutenant Commander Earl Spencer was sent to establish the naval air station on North Island. The building effort soon included hangars, buildings, 
runways, and streets. This air controller's tower and administration building was designed in a Spanish-influenced style by noted San Diego architect Richard Requa. It is still used as an administration building today. Additional changes came to the island when a causeway joining North Island to 4th Avenue in Coronado was built at a cost of $47,000. The link was over 3,000 feet long and was accessible by wagon, automobiles, and a spur line of the railroad. World War I was over in 1918, and to celebrate the monumental victory, 212 planes flew in a spectacular parade of flight over San Diego Bay. This was the largest number of airplanes to ever fly in one location at the same time. Aviation had advanced so far and so fast that the feats of the Americans astonished the world. Naval aviators came home from the war with a glamour, a dash, and a daring that would never be equaled again. These heroes of the sky set the style for a future breed of daring young men and their flying machines that would rule the air. The 1920s was a time in aviation history when nothing seemed impossible. New inventions and exciting adventures followed each other so fast that the world could hardly keep up. Using an F-5 seaplane, Commander Henry Muston flew an epic round-trip flight from North Island to Panama in 1920. The 7,000-mile trip, with an average speed of 60 miles per hour, took 109 hours to accomplish. This feat showed the world the feasibility of long flights across the Pacific Ocean. During the 1920s, radio communication was a major priority and aircraft radio experiments were underway. Up to this point, the Navy had used carrier pigeons to convey messages to the pilots and far-flung bases. Rear Admiral William A. Moffat, head of the Bureau of Aeronautics, was known as the Air Admiral for his development of tactics for naval aircraft and the introduction of the aircraft carrier. Night flying was instituted. The first all-metal airplane with an air-cooled engine was put into testing phases. Experiments with lighter-than-air airships were underway, and it was believed that North Island could serve as a station for the new dirigibles. In 1924, the Navy's dirigible, the Shenandoah, traveled to North Island from its base in Lakehurst, New Jersey. Over 25,000 people visited Rockwell Field to see the amazing airship. Unfortunately, later in the year, the Shenandoah crashed in a storm. Similar disasters convinced the Navy to abandon the idea of dirigibles, and the Navy concentrated on planes and their potential for military use. The merging of planes and ships resulted in the creation of more specialized aircraft carriers. The USS Langley was the nation's first aircraft carrier, and it was assigned to North Island in 1922. The carrier was converted from its original use as a coal carrier, and she was home ported at North Island until 1936, when she was again converted to a seaplane tender. She was eventually sunk in 1942 while carrying planes to Java early in World War II. In 1928, North Island aviators Bill Davies, Tommy Tomlinson, and Putt Storrs were the three men who formed a team called the Navy Seahawks that dazzled audiences with their daring feats. Standing with these original Seahawks is Mort Murray, this group of aero-acrobatic flying demonstrators attracted world attention and were the forerunners of the Blue Angels. These men associated with other aviation pioneers, including Charles Lindbergh, who had just completed the first long-distance flight across the Atlantic Ocean to Paris, and Amelia Earhart, who had perished on her attempt to fly around the world. The young pilots with their dash and daring were naturals for the Hollywood movie screen. Several movies were filmed at North Island and included The Flying Fleet with Hollywood heartthrob Ramon Navarro and the beautiful Anita Page, Sea Eagles with Wallace Berry, and Hell Divers with Berry and Clark Gable. Movie stars visited the Hotel Del Coronado on a regular basis and were popular visitors to the island. By the early 1930s, two more aircraft carriers were based at North Island, the USS Lexington and the USS Saratoga. The ships measured 888 feet long, and each could hold 72 airplanes and 2,000 soldiers. Even by today's standards, 
they were marvels of technology. In 1935, they were joined by the USS Ranger, the first aircraft carrier to be built specifically as a carrier from the keel up. Landing on a flight deck is one of the most difficult things a Navy pilot will ever do. The flight deck has only about 500 feet of runway space for landing planes. To land on the flight deck, each plane needs a tail hook, which is exactly what it sounds like, an extended hook attached to the plane's tail. The pilot's goal is to snag the tail hook on one of four arresting wires. There's, there's nothing, there's, I don't think anything really much more satisfactory than getting a nice, as they call it, OK3 wire, cross deck pendant they call it, uh, when you hook, hook the airplane, OK3, the, the four wires, catch number three, OK3, and it's, it's really a, you're trying to stay away from the number one wire because uh, as you came in, there wasn't quite enough clearance with the jet uh, to be really safe touching number one wire. Order of priority, you wanted a three. Probably the next in priority would be to get a four, I guess. Then two and then one. But but you start off you start off not being as good as you are later on. Later on in my career, you know, if I did not get an OK three, I was upset. I have to say I enjoyed every flight I ever took off of a carrier except in the middle of the night and pouring down rain in the middle of the Indian Ocean. The use of the big aircraft carriers led to a need for a deeper harbor. They couldn't reach North Island with the existing depth of the bay, and at the time air and land space was becoming more congested. Both the Navy and the Army wanted to control all of North Island, and the space sharing arrangement was not working out. Each wanted the other to leave the island. The dilemma was eventually resolved at the highest levels of government. President Franklin Roosevelt came to North Island to see the situation for himself. He approved the transfer of all of North Island to the U.S. Navy, and plans were then established to dredge the bay to accommodate the big carriers and use the dredge mud to create about 500 new acres of space. In the late 1930s through the 40s, new planes were constantly being developed. This Douglas TDB-1 signals some of the changes reflected by aircraft advances. The cockpit is enclosed, the plane has retractable landing gear and an all-metal construction. The new planes had increased speed and range, and the wings folded to facilitate storage. War came to America on December 7, 1941. The Navy fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and the Army planes at Hickam Army Base, also in Hawaii, were ravaged by Japanese attack planes. None of the Navy's aircraft carriers were in port at Pearl Harbor that fateful day. Planes from North Island were flown over immediately to assist the bases in Hawaii and launch the war against Japan. As a key component of the Pacific operations, North Island went into overdrive to get ready for war. Buildings were sandbagged and some citizens in Coronado built bomb shelters. Revetment structures were built to hide planes. Liberty bonds were for sale and the community helped the effort with a huge scrap metal drive. The war demanded greater and greater resources on North Island by 1944. The Spanish Bight was filled in. The old causeway that had linked North Island to Coronado was removed. Coronado became home to many of the aircraft factory workers and dependents of the Mammoth Base. Workers were involved around the clock building new planes such as the Hellcat, Avenger, and Wildcat names that became known to every American schoolboy. The war ended in 1945, but Naval Air Station North Island remained important to the successful operation of the military's defense of the nation. Coronado was home not only to the carriers and the planes, but also to the personnel on the base. For many of the pilots and their families, the dream was always to retire in Coronado. No matter where their tours of duty took them, the goal was always to return and live in the place they called home. Servicemen who had purchased or rented homes sent their children to local schools, joined clubs, and participated in community life. Well, at one time they used to call uh, Coronado the elephant's graveyard uh, because there were 86 retired flag officers in the phone book. This would have been in the, uh, probably the 1980s. Coronado offered a setting for the camaraderie of those who shared similar experiences and interests. Local service clubs and organizations brought together men who had served in the military and had been stationed at various times at the base. Retired or active aviators took easily to the island style of life 
and gathered at the local restaurants, hotel bars, coffee shops, parks, and bookstores. But it was, it was the meeting place, particularly uh, after flying and so forth. You went to, we called it Mexpac, and uh, that was the place to be, and they had a piano bar, and it, it was really, you talk to any of the old timers, ask how things are at Mexpac, which really is no longer. But it was a great success. Contributing to the life in Coronado was also important to these families. I retired on the 1st of uh, January 1976 and immediately got involved with practically everything in Coronado. Well, the parade, the 4th of July parade, you, you had to make that. Well, Coronado is the best place to live in the world, and that's why we're here. To elaborate, if I may, uh, Jig, uh, the, the ethos and flying, the camaraderie, the whole experience, and, you know, taking an airplane up in a beautiful day like today and, and just doing all, pulling six Gs and up on top of the clouds and, and then coming down and, and the precision required and the whole group of people with whom you're associated is, is, is what makes it, as I say, not only fun but richly rewarding. Today, Naval Air Station North Island stands as an important military complex in the nation's defense system. As part of a larger complex of eight bases known as Naval Base Coronado, it is home port to aircraft carriers like the USS Vincent and USS Ronald Reagan, and with the full complement of ships, pilots, support staff, civilian workers, and associated staff, the base system has over 35,000 people attached to its command. North Island has continued to support its mission from its humble beginnings as a site of man's early dreams to fly, all the way to the full realization of that dream with jets, aircraft carriers, and global operations. But oh, for those first marvelous days, when the skies and the waters around a tiny island reverberated with whoops and yells of success, when a fragile flying machine in one breathless moment held the limitless vision of man's dreams of flight.